Recently, Leslie Appleton Young, she's the chief economist for the California Association of Realtors, stopped by the Bay East offices and we sat down for a long conversation where she talks about the tools that she uses as an economist in predicting what's going to happen with the real estate market. Let's check it out. Leslie, welcome to Bay East. David, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Very good. Leslie, as you know, there is so much information out there about real estate, about economics, and for as much information as out there, whether it's online or in the media, you've got a bunch of people that think that they're experts about real estate and about economics. Let's talk about what you do as an economist, the things that you look at when you're studying the current market and what's going to happen with real estate. So what are the building blocks of, of your job as an economist? Well, I hate to be so rudimentary, but I think demand and supply is really where we start. And when you look on the demand side, you're looking at job growth, income growth, household formation. You're looking at the general tenor of the economy with respect to consumer confidence. You're obviously looking at housing prices and mortgage rates looking at affordability, I mean, how easy, and at underwriting standards, how easy is it for people to get, uh, get loans. You're looking at the global market, and I think this is one of the biggest changes that I've seen in the decades I've been with the California Association of Realtors, is that for many parts of California, you need to look at them in comparison to global capitals around the globe, because you know, we look very unaffordable, and we are in, in many areas, certainly in the Bay Area, but one of the reasons you've got international buyers and international capital coming in is we look very good. We're quite a bargain compared to, um, compared to many overseas destinations, and that means all cash buyers, that means difficult for uh, first-time buyers to compete. So there are just a multitude of factors that you look at to kind of gauge overall demand. With respect to the market itself and where it's going, I would say the one most critical uh, variable that I look at in terms of where the market's heading is inventory. Absolutely inventory. How much is on the market? What kind of increase have we seen in anticipation of the spring home buying season compared to similar periods in past years? And that certainly explains the challenge of the market the last three or four years. We have had a very, very low uh, inventory of homes on the market. And that's meant the housing market has been good, but it hasn't been great. I would say the California market has been underperforming, not because of the demand side, which you know, you've got the Bay Area economy, the strongest regional economy in the country, right? You've got good job growth, you've got good uh, income growth. We've actually seen last year a rebound in household formation, right? So the kids that moved back home are going, hey, now I can go get a job and the parents are ready to let them go and you have new households uh, being formed. So on the demand side, it's been uh, very promising, very positive. On the supply side, we don't have enough baby boomers listing and selling, and we don't have enough new construction. So um, I would say of all the things I look at, it's inventory that is probably um, the most critical um, to so look in, at. In the, the world of information that's out there, you know, we hear about interest rates, we hear about the stock market, the bond market, employment. Is that, all, is that all just noise, or should we be paying attention to any of those other factors in terms of their impact on us? I think you have to pay attention to everything. And one of the interesting things about the tech stock bubble that we saw in 1999 and early 2000 was we did some surveys at the time, and of all of the places in California, the answer to the question, did the stock market play a role in the, your decision to buy or sell property? Well, in Silicon Valley, it was quite high compared to other places. So there are always um, local situations that will have a big, um, a big impact. You know, trying to kind of ascertain consumer sentiment um, is, is a challenge because it is impacted by everything that you mentioned 
and just about everything else, right? We're living in a 24-7 news cycle. There are experts everywhere. I mean, bloggers on real estate and the economy are, I don't want to say a dime a dozen, but there are a lot of people uh, to listen to and, and talk to. So I think you really have to look at, um, at everything. But I do think it's important to focus on the data. Look at the numbers, right? Look at, for example, migration, right? We talked about migration um, earlier today. Alameda County is gaining residents from San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. Alameda County is losing residents to Stanislaus and San Joaquin and Sonoma and Contra Costa to more affordable areas. So what is the takeaway? Housing affordability matters and people vote with their feet because they have to. If there was one economic indicator that you would suggest people look at in terms of predicting where real estate is going to go, what would that one economic indicator be? I think it would be inventory. Um, for sure, but clearly there's a lot of secondary, secondary factors, and you mentioned them. Mortgage rates are are critical. Uh, typically, when rates go up, you get a surge in activity because it injects urgency into the market. People want to move before it's too late. It's too late. It gives them a reason uh, to get um, on with the um, transaction. I think another kind of more um, a higher level factor is just um, kind of a, a lifestyle. There's been a lot of, or where people are in their life cycle. So there's been a lot of talk, uh, at least a few years ago, about these millennials, right? And the millennials, they're mobile, they don't want to own homes, they're not really interested in that, they want to be um, able to move on a dime. All of that is wrong. You know, what the data shows is millennials are as interested in home ownership as anybody else once they settle down, get married, and have a family, right? Once they're ready to create a household. But what happened to that generation is when they graduated, there were no jobs, right? So they weren't able to kind of leave the nest. And now that they're doing that, other things are going to be important. Now, some people delay adulthood forever, right? And they're never ready to settle down, and they have a certain um, uh, type of housing that they're uh, looking for. And I don't want to imply that, that younger people don't have a different um, aesthetic or idea of what constitutes the package of a great place to live. But I do know that once people have children, schools are important. And before that time, they're not important. And I think the uh, relationship between school quality and housing, I mean, here we are sitting in beautiful Pleasanton, where you have this beautiful environment and fabulous schools, they really go hand in hand. So I don't have a, an easy one-off answer uh, to that question. I think inventory is key, but it's a very dynamic landscape. So it's assuming that inventory is fixed, what you're recommending then is look at demand in terms of ability to act on wanting to buy a home driven by interest rates or bigger demographic changes, for instance, the baby boomers. Right. So if someone wanted to do some poking around and be an armchair economist, maybe dig into some census information about what are the demographics in a particular community, are there a bunch of baby boomers that might be getting ready to retire and sell their homes? Absolutely. And I think one of the, speaking of the baby boomers, I think one of the big issues that we're facing today is that boomers are staying in their homes so much longer. And again, part of that is kind of the qualitative issue that these baby boomers don't see themselves as old, right? They're getting plastic surgery, they're working out, they're traveling, they're you know, friends with their kids. I mean, they're not getting old in the traditional way that, that other generations did. And so they're kind of attached to their current living environment. Plus in California, um, they've got uh, Prop 13, which means that's a huge benefit to have a low, a low tax rate. They may have refinanced into a very affordable mortgage. Um, there's just all kinds of um, kind of financial reasons that are keeping them Put. So that's positive for them, but it's been a challenge for the market. Leslie, great insights on, on how to be an economist and the things that you're, that you're looking at. Let's look at 
what's happening in real estate now and what's going to happen in the future, specifically in California. Big question in everybody's mind is supply. What's on the market? So from your perspective as chief economist with CAR, what's going on with supply? Well, there's not enough on the market uh, because we haven't been building very much in California the last five or six years. Um, 2016 will be the first year that we've broken 100,000 units. We were almost there in 2015, but the first time in five or six years. Uh, just based on household formation, we need about 165,000 units a year, and we've been well below that for quite some time. So in terms of new construction, we are challenged. And in terms of inventory of existing single family homes, we are challenged because the baby boomers just simply are not um, doing the different things that their, their parents did. They're not really interested uh, in Dell Webb and Leisure World and they wanna stay in the mix. They're working longer uh, partly because they have to, you know, they may need to rebuild from the financial crisis, and partly because they want to. They want to stay in the game, so they're staying healthier and being part of the action longer. But it is creating um, a different balance within the housing market. Uh, and I think the bottom line is we are going to see more and more of our millennial households leaving California for other states where housing is more affordable. So Texas, Arizona, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, all offer cities that have very positive amenities for millennials plus affordable housing. And that, I don't think there's really any other way around that. You know, I think where people are gonna vote with their feet because they have to, not because they want to. And that's countered by the tech workers and whatnot moving to California or portions of California. So it's not like we're experiencing this exodus of people out of California. There's still going to be a strong demand. Well, there is. And we're getting, and those are the households you're not really worried about with respect to housing affordability because they're making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year. They're working for the, the, the tech space um, companies and doing quite well. But it really is the formerly blue collar, the working uh, families, the middle class, the you know policemen, teachers, firemen, uh, retail, that group of, of households uh, has really been challenged uh, by, uh, by the market and may and, and again, I think the millennials, right the, 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 not everybody is going to work in tech, you know and you come out of school, you've been working a while, you get married, you're thinking about kids and you look around California, you look around the Bay Area, where can you go? What are my alternatives? So I think you're more open to doing something different when you're priced out of the area that you that you love. Let's, let's talk about the, the future of inventory. You mentioned that while there is new construction planned in some areas, that hasn't kept up with demand and probably won't keep up with demand going forward. So the other part of the equation is people that are sitting in big homes that may not be appropriate for their size. So if we wanted to predict from a demographic perspective, and if we wanted to maybe identify a tipping point, would it be when we start to see baby boomers retire? Or you know, how can we predict what may cause people to put their homes on the market? I, th I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think the answer is it depends. There's probably a couple different scenarios that are relevant. But in general, you're gonna have more boomers not only retiring later, but even when they retire, they're gonna stay put because they can't afford to move. So housing affordability isn't just an issue for first time buyers getting into the market. It's also an issue for current homeowners who even though they may have significant equity, they're gonna get hit with capital gains taxes if their net gain is over 500,000. They're gonna lose their Prop 13 tax basis. Um, they're gonna lose their low rate mortgage that even though rates are very attractive today, they were even more attractive a couple of years ago and you had a lot of refinance activity um, at that time. So I think you're gonna see more inventory come on related to, I hate to say it, but probate, <laughs> as opposed to retiring and making different 
choices. Now, some people, for example, may decide to go rent an apartment and rent out their home and create income, um, uh, create um, income from an income property um, as opposed to to making a sale. But there really is a perfect storm right now that's keeping boomers where they are uh, a lot longer. And I think one of the one of the things that we have to think about is is there a way to educate uh, and encourage boomers who have significant equity in their home to take some of that equity and help their children become home owners and start on that ladder of home ownership. And that would be a win-win for everybody. So let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the, the purchase side of things, which of course speaks to sales prices. We've seen dramatic increase in sales prices going back to 2004, 2005, 2006. Similar thing has happened in the last few years coming out of the recession. If what you're saying is true, supply is going to be fixed going forward, what's going to happen with sales prices? You know, I think you are going to see um, moderation in house price appreciation. I mean, things can't get too far out of whack when you have a lending environment that is as rational as I think it is today. So I don't it's a, think it's there, a different world from it's a very, other. yeah, I think it's a very different world from, uh, from that perspective. We are seeing um, statewide appreciation in the mid single digits. And three years ago, it was in the double digits. So things have really slowed down. I would say 2013 was really the peak of the intensity of this, this market cycle and things are slowing down because essentially you've got people that are priced out taking their demand and moving it to other counties and to other states. They're not, um, they don't have an unlimited budget. So looking back at 2005, 2006, we could, we could predict when things were going to tip because of the financing mechanisms, when those loans reset or when that market collapsed. What would cause things to tip in our current environment? The um, job creation in the tech sector uh, is clearly one of the foundations of, uh, of the boom in, um, in jobs and in economic growth in California. I think some of these companies have figured out a, a very um, rational, solid revenue model, and others have not, right? So you're seeing the write downs for some of the IPOs, Yahoo just wrote down uh, Tumblr, things like that. Facebook, on the other hand, Google have done, um, have done very well. Um, you know, one of the things I think is clear is nothing lasts forever, right? And, and uh, economies mature and growth rates uh, level, level off. So there are always kind of exogenous events that you can't predict. You can call them a black swan or a thundering herd of black elephants, whatever you want to call it. Um, it could be, you know, it could be anything, right? Uh, but just kind of trying to have a normal uh, kind of a, a, a focus here on what is realistic, I think it would be kind of the health of the of the tech sector going forward, particularly uh, in the Bay Area. So that's the early warning system. If someone wants to predict when things are gonna change price-wise, watch tech. If there's a major change in tech, that could have a ripple effect throughout the rest of the economy. Right, and if the equity market reflects that and people lose a lot of wealth, even if it's paper wealth, that's gonna uh, affect their decisions and so on, right? The, the one thing I wanna say is, uh, back to this, this look at kind of global real estate, um, U.S. in general and California, New York, and Florida specifically are, I think, viewed as safe havens for foreign capital. And when things get dicey, be it you know terrorism, political, China, whatever it is, we tend to be the beneficiary of the uncertainty going on in other parts of the globe because it's not even about yield, it's about safety. You know, and I think for some people, real estate is looked at as like a currency. You know, I've it's got real. the house, it's real, it's gonna stay there, it's not gonna go away, I'm, I'm good, right? It's safe. So we've talked about limited inventory and high demand 
pretty good price appreciation, not as dramatic. Let's tie this all together. Are people able to purchase homes in California? What's the future of actual sales activity for residential real estate in California? You know, I think it's going to be what it has been the last couple of years, which is solid but muted. It's not reflecting the strength of the fundamentals because so many people are priced out of the market. So, um, you know, you, I, I think it's, you have a people that want to move, right? They want to downsize. They want to live somewhere else, but they literally uh, um, can't do that because they can't afford it. And I think that's one of the things that's really keeping a lid, uh, a lid on transactions. Now, on the kind of buy side, some of the positive things are that investor activity is declining. Uh, one of the realtors I talked to earlier today said uh, his last transaction had 18 multiple offers and not one of them was all cash, which is very unusual. So that means people with loans have a chance. And maybe first-time buyers with FHA loans will have more of a chance um, more of a chance going forward. So I, I don't want to be too pessimistic. I, I think we'll, we'll see a good market, but I do want to just suggest that there are some major speed bumps that are keeping things um, un, in check. It's a different market from 2005, 2006. We're not seeing the frenzy, uh, but while, while we are seeing those dramatic price increases. Now you mentioned investors. And, and it's interesting because you say it's a good thing that there are fewer investors and there are people with mortgages purchasing homes. Does that imply that at some point those non-investors will then put their homes back on the market, which could help with supply? Well, yeah. I mean, once you get into kind of the spectrum of home ownership, you own it, you gain equity, your income goes up and you're able to trade up, your family gets bigger and so on. So just getting people started is really the important thing. And I, I do want to say I am a huge um, fan and very appreciative of the role that investors play in the market. You know, it was the investors who were going into communities in the Central Valley uh, in 2009 and buying everything they could, they could because they knew that the market would recover, even though other people thought they were crazy. They weren't. They are the canary in the coal mine. So investors play a very important part in market cycles, but the fact that the price play has played itself out, I say the easy money in real estate has been made in this cycle, and the fact that you have fewer investors and fewer all-cash transactions means that millennials have more of an opportunity to compete uh, in the market. And that's, that's some great news. Right, and that's some great news. So we've, we've talked about your experience as an economist and the things that you look at in, in studying the current and future markets. We've talked about what's happening right now in California real estate. I want to go back to your, your 30 years of experience with the California Association of Realtors and, and turn inward for a second. Let's talk about the realtor profession. What's happening with the realtor profession? What's going to happen with the realtor profession? I want you to tap into your experience with the strategic planning things that CIR has done. So what's going on with the profession? More clients, consumers are using realtors today than 20 or 30 years ago. This whole issue of disintermediation uh, of the role of the realtor in the transaction has not happened. And I don't want to say 20 years from now things might look very different than they do today. But there is absolutely no question that today a buyer and a seller look to a realtor to navigate a very choppy environment, right? If you're a buyer, you need someone that knows where the properties are, uh, where the trade-offs are, how to put in a, a, a solid offer. All of those things are um, hard to get off a blog post or a website. You know, it's, it's a very kind of high touch listening, you know. And for sellers, they need, um, you know, they need to prepare their home for sale. They need to set a price that, you know, one of the challenges of the market right now is that seller expectations are still like this, whereas the appreciation in the market is now 
more like this, you know, and if they really are interested in a quick sale, um, they need, so it's, it's been, um, I think, very um, uh, heartening for the industry to kind of see the value add that's brought to the table um, from, from a realtor. And this doesn't mean that all of the, the apps and the tech and the speed and the this and the that um, don't make a difference because they absolutely do. But in terms of the number of transactions, Realtors 20 years ago were doing more transactions than they are today per realtor. And um, I think maybe one way of understanding that is that the um, industry has a very uneven um, uh, distribution of sales, that there's always a few market leaders and everybody else, you know, and then there's people that aren't involved really in the industry at all, even though they still have a license and they're a member of the association. And I think one of the things that for me personally um, is the most exciting about our industry is that people can come in either brand new or from another industry and be successful. You know, I like to say that you do, if you do what your broker tells you to do, you're going to do really well. It's just that what your broker tells you to do is hard. You know, one of the things I've noticed um, as I go around uh, around the state is there never seems to be a problem getting a panel of top producers together telling people exactly what they do. Here's how I do it. Here's what my day looks like. Here's how I organize things. Here's how I stay in touch with past clients. This is how much I spend on networking all of that is very transparent. The challenge is it's hard to do, you know, so it becomes, it's a very personal business. What am I bringing to the table as a human being and a real estate professional today, this morning, to make it a great day? So Leslie, you, you've been involved in organized real estate. You've seen the, the California Association of Realtors, how it works the board of directors. I work for a local association. We have a board of directors. It's a sophisticated group, but it's really run by realtors, and the direction comes from realtors. Is it possible for one realtor to make a difference in this profession in guiding the association so that it's responsive to the fundamentally dynamic nature of the real estate profession? Absolutely. Um, you have no idea how um, diverse the population of realtors is and the skill set that they bring to their involvement in organized real estate. And, you know, you go to your first board meeting and there are, you know, 900 people in the room and you think, my goodness, this is crazy. How do they do it? And yet trusting the process and the fact that all of the different voices need to be heard gives you the most, the best result, right? Gives you a consensus on a piece of legislation or, or on a direction. And I, so I have a lot of um, respect for the process of organized real estate. I am always very appreciative of volunteers, particularly volunteers that are active and successful in the business because they bring a sensibility to the decision-making that reflects the working realtor in the field that doesn't have time to get involved, um, involved in organized real estate. So can an individual person make a difference? Absolutely, and they do all the time. Leslie, thank you so much. More than 30 years of experience. We really appreciate you sharing your observations about what you do as an economist, how things are happening in the market, and your predictions for the future. Thank you for spending some time with us. My pleasure, it's been great, thank you.